Hi, everybody. I'm Addie Broyles. I write about food for the Austin American Statesman. Um, today, we're going to have a conversation about grocery stores in Austin, and I brought in a couple of local grocery shoppers. Aren't we all grocery shoppers? Um, some people who shop with perhaps a, a keen eye around town. Uh, this is Megan Irwin. She is a recipe developer and food stylist, formerly of Cook's Country, yeah. moved to Austin a few years ago, uh, and now does food styling all over the state. So she shops she does a lot of grocery shopping. And joining us virtually is Will Burdett. Say hi, Will. Hi, guys. Uh, Will, tell us about your podcast. Uh, I do a podcast on food. It's called No Satiation. And um, it's a sort of ever-evolving project. Uh, but I try to look at how food uh, shapes culture and, uh, and stuff like that. Very good. OK, so the big news today is that, well, we, we know that Trader Joe's is going to open for I think it was like two months ago they announced that September 20th right. would be their opening day. Um, but just yesterday, Wheatsville announced that they were also going to open up their doors today. And so that means that essentially two grocers who, you know, who have represent very distinct um, and serve very distinct markets in, in Austin are adding stores. Wheatsville is the second location. They've had a store up near the University of Texas campus for 37 years. And wow. they have something like 13,000 members. And so, you know, I've been talking to their management, and basically they, people have been asking them about a second store for 30 years, you know. <laughs> and, and so now that's finally here. But we also have this newcomer, which is, you know, Trader Joe's. And, um, Megan, you have lived in places where there are Trader Joe's before. Yeah. How are they different than normal grocery stores? Um, I lived in Boston, and there was a Trader Joe's in my neighborhood, and it was full of students and busy all the time. I mean, all the time. Um, the convenience items are plentiful. There's, you know, sandwiches. You, you bought a few today. Um, We've got props to show you. So then I think definitely at where I was living catered to a college atmosphere. Right. Um, so a lot of frozen foods. Absolutely. Yeah. Frozen foods, um, produce seemed inexpensive, especially for Boston. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that um, sort of deterred me from buying produce there is it all seemed bagged. Mm -hmm. You couldn't grab a lemon or two. You had to buy a bag of ten. Wow. Yeah. So that kind of shopping wasn't for me because I also lived alone. And, mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, their frozen food section is well, the, the money maker. I also sold so by the just buy the each instead of by the pound, which if you do buy it, if they do have like apples, right. like 70 cents an apple or today, you know, I, so I went into the store this morning and it was 29 cents for uh, one organic banana. Okay. You know, so it kind of makes you yeah. think differently about the cost of food. Right. Um, but I think there are some perceptions about Trader Joe's that it's um, all organic or that it's, I don't know, or the, you know, that it's uh, almost like a, like a, you know, a, more, a, le a lesser expensive Whole Foods. But I don't know that that comparison is appropriate. I mean, Will, where do you think Trader Joe's kind of fits into Austin? I don't have a whole lot of experience with Trader Joe's. I've only been there a couple times in different um, locations, one in California. Um, but most of what I hear about Trader Joe's is that people love to go there for the two-buck chuck. Mm -hmm. uh, Good point. <laughs> so, you know, maybe there are certain items that people go to Trader Joe's for that they know that they can count on. Um, you know, that are cheap and, you know, uh, of a quality that, you know, they're comfortable with. Right. Well, I think yeah. it really represents this, like, we uh, live in this good enough generation right now where I, I first learned about this when the flip camera came out, which, you know, is this video camera that did not make excellent videos, right. but it was good enough. And that we kind of, as a society, are, are kind of getting to this point where, you know, we don't necessarily want the very, very best of every single thing, but we want something that is just good enough to suit our needs, right. but that isn't, but, you know, that has the price, you know, lower price so that we can afford to buy it. Yeah, it's definitely that sort of throwaway shopping, mm -hmm. like you can do with clothes and anything, exactly. you know, the Forever 21s and H&Ms are the same way, where right. you buy things for that instant gratification, and it's, it's not going to last, it's not the top quality wine, yeah. but, but if you want enough. it then, you know, now and every day, maybe. Right. So, so that's in, what's interesting is that um, the other opening today is Wheatsville. And um, Will, you work near uh, Wheatsville, the current Wheatsville, and live near the new one. So tell us about what you're excited about uh, and what 
that particular co-op, you know, what kinds of groceries they sell. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good uh, question. <laughs> One thing, like, so I work, uh, you know, on campus at UT, but then I drive south to go home, and I never find myself going to Wheatsville because I won't go north at the beginning or end of the day, you know, and then fight all that traffic, right? So I'm always sort of, you know, heading south. The momentum just takes me home uh, south. And so I don't shop at, at Wheatsville as much as I, as I maybe would like to. So when one opened in my neck of the woods, I, I, that made me really excited. But I'm sort of trying to temper my excitement about it because I think I have this sort of ideal built up in my head about, mm -hmm. like, how it's going to be this, like, perfect utopian grocery store. Um, it's like literally a, a block or two from my front door. Like it's the closest you could imagine a grocery store. Um, and, you know, we took a, I took a little uh, Instagram video. Let's see if we can show it. There's the outside. I mean, so you can yeah, see yeah. the scaffolding is still up on the outside of the store. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, I think that they really did. I think they the decision to open the store today um, was certainly prompted by Trader Joe's opening. Absolutely. Didn't realizing yeah. that they could sort of capitalize on some of the momentum, right. that here we are, you know, everybody's just talking about this other store. What about this homegrown institution that has been around and, and you know, by all accounts is, is beloved in this city? Um, I don't know. Did, you, did it feel unfinished or? No, the inside actually feels finished. Um, I'm just hoping we could actually get a little uh, glimpse inside. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, they, I was in there Wednesday, and it did not look, the inside did not look finished, and, and now, I mean, it looks really great inside. It reminds me a lot of the HEB at Miller, the new one up mm -hmm. there, where they, mm -hmm. they've got a, a big focus on uh, energy efficiency and LED lights, and they've got these solar tubes up in the ceiling so that there's oh. not a lot of fluorescent lighting, and um, it's a big store. Um, you know, it's, it's bigger than the original location up on campus. And um, let's see. But yeah, I mean, it, the produce is great. They've got like 90% organics right now and a lot of local. And, and what I was really struck by was hearing the management talk and then talking to some of the consumers who, you know, they don't pay attention to the fact that it's 20 or 30% higher in costs than what you might pay at a, a you know, I, I don't shop as much organic, so I probably shouldn't say that exact figure, you know, comparing organic apples to organic apples at right. Whole Foods and Wheatsville, but, um, you know, just as the average shopper, for me, it, it seems more expensive than what I'm used to paying, mm -hmm. yeah. but for them, the value is there because it's sustainability, it's supporting local producers, it's supporting local farmers, you know, those are all buzzwords that we use to talk about food. The feel-good shopping. But they sure. are doing it. Yeah. And, and, they're, and they know that they're working toward um, creating a better society and that those are really the utopian, idealistic dreams that I think brought a lot of us to Austin in the first place. Yeah. I don't know so, if you it that way. <laughs> so is there something about um, Wheatsville that seems more, I hate to use this term, but authentic than... Um, a place like Trader Joe's yeah. or even Oh Trader's yeah, or yeah, I would say so. Um, I think that Wheatsville, yeah, I would say so. I mean, they are really embodying the local values. You know, they carry more local products than probably just about any other grocery store in town. You know, so if you're a small startup and you're making small batch hot sauce, like mm -hmm. Yellowbird is a great example of that. Um, I found out about that company last year and, and Wheatsville started carrying it because of consumer demand. And so many people have been asking for it. Um, and Trader Joe's, on the other hand, they've got lots of really interesting products. You know, here's some um, inside-out carrot cake cookies that I bought this morning. Mm. Six dollars for six little cookie cookie pies. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, there's no claim of sustainability. There's no claim of local. There's no right. sense that you're supporting your fellow your fellow Austinite. And I think that that. You know, it's easy to get, it's kind of like all that's shiny and new. You walk in there and it's like, oh, this is so exciting. And there's all these very happy employees. I mean, mm -hmm. it creates jobs. We can't deny the fact that both of these stores are going to be an economic boom for for their respect. Uh, um, Trader Joe's is technically in Rollingwood and not Austin. But, um, but you know, it, this is still, this is Corporate. processed food. Yeah. This yeah. is processed food that comes from California. And, um, you know, if you're really interested in having a connection to the people who are producing your food, then Trader Joe's is not going to be right the place for you. Right. Well, and Wheatsville almost seems like it's 
uh, organized, you know, convenient farmer's market every single day. Mm -hmm. So exactly. instead of waiting, you know, to go Wednesday and Saturday or whatever the days that you go, Wheatsville just has it there ready all the time. Exactly. Um, and I think people need that. And I get, busy. you know, honestly, sometimes I can be like stolen for saying this, but I get deterred from the farmer's markets because I need to know what I can get especially for work or yeah. whatever, recipe development. Like, I need to know it's there. Right. And not go and, like, be like, oh, there's they're working months ahead of time, too. Exactly. So, so you need something that's really, you know, it's season, like, in the winter time, and it's not winter. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. Will, are you a farmer's market guy? Yeah. I mean, I have been at various stages in my life. Um, I I love farmer's markets. I, I love that they exist. I love that Austin has so many of them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm becoming increasingly a fan of CSA, you know, um, programs and stuff like that, or even things like Greenling um, yeah. or Coterie Market or some of the other grocery delivery type services. Um, in fact, I just started uh, participating in the farm to work thing here at UT, mm -hmm. and we get like a box of produce. I think it's from Lightsey Farms, um, 20 bucks for uh, per week, and it comes loaded up with this, you know, produce, and um, that's great, except, you know, you can't really predict, I mean, they, they, they tell you what's going to be in the box or whatever, but from week to week it changes, and you can kind of trade things in and out if you want, but there is that sort of element of um, of, of surprise or, or not being able to count on exactly what you want, right? So you give up some of that control. Exactly, you give yeah. up some of that control. But um, I mean, for me, some nights it's like um, a cooking challenge, you know, where I get the the basket and I, and I take it home, and I'm like, all right, the clock's ticking. Like the secret box. And yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The produce is about to go bad, and yeah. like, you know, last week it was black-eyed peas and okra were like the two sort of challenge ingredients because um, my wife hates black-eyed peas, and so I had to figure out how to use a whole bag of fresh black-eyed peas in a way that was going to be palatable to her. Right. Uh, yeah. So I made hummus. Uh, totally uh, hey, good good idea. Well, I mean, and then, you know, and then the okra, you know, okra is, like, notoriously slimy, and so there's only a couple things you can do with that. Yeah. And so, like, it's a cooking challenge, and that's fun, right, for me, because I, I love to cook. But at the same time, like, that's... A luxury. Some weeks, if faced with that, that would be the thing that, like, you know, the straw that broke the camel's yeah. back. You know, it's be the I, one thing. Like, I'm just hungry, and then you end up eating fast food or something. Well, and right. exactly to your point, I did a, um, a CSA for maybe six months mm -hmm. um, just to see what it was about, and I like never want to see a turnip again. <laughs> I'm like, if I really, I mean, you have to be willing to like explore different cooking yeah. techniques and I think CSA boxes are really are for cooking minded people mm -hmm. that are are ready to explore and try new ingredients it made me eat a lot more vegetables because yeah. Yeah. and it was just my husband and I so were like what you have to cook all the time yeah just to keep up with so it. it started to not be economical for us yeah. Um, but yeah, the the challenge of especially fall or winter months with CSA is that you have a box of root vegetables, yeah. and there's only so much you can really. Yeah, I was uh, our CSA uh, adventures. We were always splitting the box with somebody, and that that worked out well. But um, you know, I haven't been able to maintain that sort of healthy. You know, finding somebody to share it with, or even getting it every other week. And then splitting it, you know, right. it seems like it was still kind of hard. Right. Um, I was going to see if maybe we could show the what Trader Joe's looks like. The morning one today, I went in and um, did another Instagram video. Uh, this is inside Trader Joe's insane. today. Uh, so there's the outside, the parking lot. It was seriously that um, getting real in the Whole Foods parking lot song popped into my head when I was trying to find a parking lot. And just look at all those people. I mean, it was shoulder to shoulder. This was before the checkout line made its way literally around the store, and it circled back around. That's too much for me. To the checkout stand. So it was a complete circle of people with their carts, and every single one of them had a smile on their face. They were very happy to be there. Well, you, you know, know there's... Been, and, but I didn't I, think I asked any of them, were they giving away bags of money? Because <laughs> I don't think I could deal with that. It was, I mean, it, it, it was a relief when I finally did walk out of there. I bought a couple, couple little things. Um, 
so I, I chatted with some people online, you know, to helpfully, you know, it made the, the time pass. But it really does, you know, we were talking about CSA boxes and, you know, farmer's market shopping. Where you're buying whole ingredients and then you're letting your imagination dictate, you're letting the seasonality and your imagination dictate what you cook. Mm -hmm. I mean, Trader Joe's really capitalizes on the fact, you know, that people, that I think they are appealing for people who have busy schedules or who either, not necessarily that they don't know how to cook, but they don't want to necessarily spend the time and effort and often money to do it. I mean, right. if you buy a, if this yep. is like a $2 frozen meal with frozen pad thai that you just microwave for, you know, three minutes, to cook that from scratch and to have the know-how so that the noodles right. don't turn out crappy, which is kind of hard for well, and that goes right back to your good enough right. discussion. Right. I mean, that's good enough for a quick dinner, for whether Love you're single or, or, yeah. or whatever, to give your child. I mean, that's exactly it right there. Yeah, yeah. so I, I do think that, it, you know, it's like uh, two different philosophies about eating and, and cooking. Not that we can't embody both, and I do think that we all kind of are walking contradictions, but, um, you know, convenience versus, um, you know, we this DIY society where we want to learn how to do things from scratch and we want to um, get back to our roots and learn how to grow our own food and mm -hmm. have our own chickens. But, you know, there's some weeks where you just need a, you just need a quiche. That's right. You need an <laughs> Ikea meatball. Like, it's just every yeah. week. <laughs> um, with less uh, horse, hopefully. Uh, so Greenling, uh, bless them, they are so funny in their newsletter. They sent out... Um, a newsletter today that was kind of talking about, they acknowledged Trader Joe's opening and sort of pointed out how they're different. Um, they really focus on organics and local and, and sustainably raised um, mm -hmm. meats and, um, and Trader Joe's. You know, there were actually protesters outside Trader Joe's today, not directly in front of the store, but over toward the road because they're, uh, I think it's Meat Without Drugs, Drug, yeah, MeWithoutDrugs.org, maybe? It's a basically consumer organization. They're trying to um, get Trader Joe's to jump on board to not sell meat that doesn't, you know, that has these chemicals and uh, antibiotics in it. And sure enough, when I was at Trader Joe's in San Antonio a couple weeks ago, like a pound of ground beef was like two sixty nine. Mm. Like when was the last time you had ground beef that cost less than $3 a pound? Yeah. 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 I mean, I really kind of cringed at the uh -huh. thought about what this poor animal had to go through. Yeah. yeah. But one cool thing that they sent out in their newsletter was this, um, there's cookie butter is a big deal at, at Trader Joe's. It's this spread. <laughs> the Biscoff that yeah. I'm Biscoff, maybe yeah. addicted to. Yeah. Eat <laughs> so good. Um, but it, it's made with palm oil and canola oil, and the cookies have all these, you know, crazy ingredients, and so there's this blogger, Foodie Fiasco, who came up with their own how to make your own cookie butter recipe that actually doesn't have cookies in it, but has whole ingredients and nuts, and, um, you know, that's probably a Google search away if you're trying to get to it, um, probably just homemade cookie butter. So it exists out there. You don't have to rely on, mm -hmm. on the already prepared stuff. So um, we've been talking about these kind of, I don't want to call them newfangled, but, you know, the, the grocery stores of, of the day. But we forget that there are all these others. You know, HEB is one of, is the biggest retailer in Central Texas, but Walmart has really been growing in terms mm -hmm. of the grocery, in the grocery market. I mean, Randall's is still, in my mind, hanging on. I, I mean, I, anytime I shop in Randall's, you know, I just notice that it's, a, you know, an, enough more expensive than I'm, I'm used to shopping and, you know, I don't know, the produce selection is kind of small, but I guess some people just really like that shopping experience. Yeah. And then there's Fiesta, and there's, um, you know, Sprouts is another one that we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what, I mean, do you think that we sort of get caught up, I mean, this is a question to both of you, um, you know, if somebody's shopping at those stores, right. do you think we spend too much time talking about sort of the, the Whole Foods and the Central Markets and the Trader Joe's? I mean, I, H, I go to H-E-B, in our neighborhood um, all the time. And I, I mean, there's days where I'm at Whole Foods, Central Market, HEB, all if I'm day. Work <laughs> all in one day, sometimes either one of those places twice a day. Wow. And it's, I keep seeing the HEB, um, and the one in our neighborhood isn't even like a fancy HEB, mm -hmm. but they are Old Forward Congress. Food Congress, yeah, um, are stepping it up. I mean, the produce is arranged nicer, it's always full, like, you know, the Whole Foods mentality of, like, mouth of everything. everything. Yeah. Um, so it seems like they're all trying to keep up with each other. Mm -hmm. um, Randall's is not my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I think their selection is a lot smaller, especially in the produce. Mm -hmm. 
But I think that kind of shopping people want is in and out. They know where everything is. There's not a ton of options. On well, sometimes just because eating different apples, it's less busy. And sometimes yeah. that's what that yeah. wants. You have yeah. to you'll pay the premium because you want a store that you're not, you know. And that's one thing we've been talking a lot about growth in Central Texas lately. And grocery stores are getting more crowded. They are. Yeah. And, you know, I'm freelance, so I have the luxury of going on off times. And you, I won't. There's no way I will go to <laughs> HEB or a grocery store on like a Monday night. Yeah. You know, it's just like I the on, worst case. I went scenario. on Sunday night before school started recently and oh my It's gosh. just like yeah. no, it's yeah. too much. So um we were well, hopefully the but, some of the the new grocery stores opening up will kind of uh make the traffic distribute across all of them so that we have uh shorter lines at all the grocery stores. I don't I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I can hope so. Yeah, as more yeah. stores open just to meet the demand. Yeah. Um, we were talking about uh, the Dollar General and how, the, you know, that's one thing that they, they're they starting to do, uh, get into the fresh, you know, perishables even more because people are looking for, uh, you know, it's like the, the um, what was the one, the Aldi's and the, um, the big box. Not the big, big lot. lot. Big lot, yeah. Uh, that they're selling, you know, they've always sold kind of, you know, knockoff third tier groceries. Right. But, um, but I think that's a growing segment of the industry that we kind of get, a, or at least I um, kind of forget that, um, you know, there are a lot of people who are grocery shopping. Absolutely. And I think the, and I'm a victim of this as well, is that I was thinking that the big lots and the Dollar General and even the Aldi's were almost expired or kind of like the dented can mm -hmm. type things. But, um, my husband works for a local food company and they, one of their biggest, you know, customers are all those stores and they're, it's not expired. It's not, you know, the weird, you know, yeah. one off. Yeah. It's, it's actually becoming grocery stores. Really and I think, stuff. you know, traveling to small areas of the country and especially the South, you know, you'll, you'll go 20 miles and the only thing you'll find is a Dollar General. Right. And then you start so, talking about food deserts and, yeah. right, you know, that we really do live in a, you know, a city where it's just an extravagance. All of the grocery options. Yeah. I mean, so the new Wheatsville just opened on South Lamar right across the street from Sprouts that it used to be Sun Harvest in that location, which is right across the street from Central Market, which is right around the corner from both the Target and the Randalls. Right. So that's essentially yeah. five places. Right. Within a, sh a small, and that's not even counting all the little communities. And the Walmart down the road. And the Walmart. Yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah. So there are, um, you know, we we take I, I take for granted the fact that there are all these options to get fresh produce when there are places like Southeast Austin and Del Valley where, um, you know, the nearest grocery store is, you know, like the Riverside uh, HEV. Wow. Yeah. And so it's 10 miles to get to yeah. a grocery store. Um, and a lot of the grocers, several of the grocers, big grocers here have faced criticism for not investing more, you know, time and money into stores over in East Austin, which, you know, when HGB opened up in the Miller development, that, you know, you know, some people were sort of questioning, well, it's like, oh, are they just opening that there? Uh, and, you know, is it going to be sort of like a Gucci bee? You know, you can't be able to talk about the Westlake. Uh, you know, there's some HGBs that are super nice, and is that really fulfilling what the neighborhood needs? But I think... The smart grocery stores are doing a lot of work with the communities to to ask what people want to you know really be have boots on the ground to figure out what people's needs are and um and that's one thing I think is interesting about Trader Joe's is like they don't have a single social media account they don't they don't participate in the conversation that's happening online about them, mm -hmm. and I've kind of wondered in the back of my head, you know is that going to seem like an affront to people in Austin who we're like such a Twitter happy place, mm -hmm. yeah. and we we like the interaction that we have. I mean, Whole Foods does an exceptional job with their Twitter accounts, where they're always engaging with people. If somebody has a question about something in the store, they know they can turn to social media right. and ask that question, or or even air that complaint and have it addressed. And so, you know, I, I don't know if people have that expectation now. You know, twenty first century expectations mm -hmm. are changing so quickly. But um, um, so I want to ask you guys about grocery delivery. I don't know if you you know remember maybe 10 or 15 years ago people were um, forecasting that you know online grocery delivering would be the the wave of the future and that yeah. everybody would be getting their groceries um, you know but Amazon although you can order everything else on Amazon 
you know, they still kind of lag in that department. I mean, do you think that we're going to start shifting to home delivery? You know, Greenling and Farmhouse are two great examples of local companies that have are, are having success. They're having success in this industry, right? But um, you know, it still hasn't become totally mainstream yet. I think. I mean, just from my small experience living in the Northeast, it's it's definitely mainstream there. Where, you know, I didn't have a car. A lot of people don't have cars. There's no parking. To go online and order, um, I think it was Peapod up there, Yeah, was incredible. So do I they mean, have a, uh, like, do you order from them or do they go and then shop somewhere else? Um, that's a good question. Like a warehouse. There was Peapod and they might have been connected to Stop and Shop. I'm not exactly sure, mm -hmm. but, um, and Stop and Shop was a grocery store up there, but, um, yeah, going in and just checking boxes of what you need mm -hmm. and having it there and not having to go out in, like, you know, a blizzard and nice. schlep bags, you know, line up your arm <laughs> up the hill yeah. to my house. I mean, that's great. great. We think we have, live in such a car society here right? Um, where you take for granted that you can carry your groceries home. And if you don't have a car and you're having to walk them home, yeah. you shop more frequently. And, um, yeah, I remember hearing once from the New Yorker, it's like, you know, you, you order, uh, it only takes you one time buying a watermelon and lugging it home to learn the Absolutely. lesson that you never buy a watermelon. Right, <laughs> right, right. I mean, New York. even, you know, carrying milk or whatever it is, it's like yeah. you're, you're weighted down. So I think in Boston and New York, definitely those um, online services are, are huge and a huge part of people's grocery experience. Will, do you think it's coming here? Yeah, I mean, I've started to use it, um, you know, sort of like here and there, little um, shops. Um, you know, Greenling does some of that in addition to fresh produce. You can, you know, get some pantry items and, and coterie market. And there's a couple little ones starting to, to pop up that I've, um, you know, kind of experimented with. And I don't know, I kind of feel like um, like we're going to see a diversification of how we shop. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, I shop at Central Market a lot. Um, sometimes I walk there, sometimes I drive there. It depends on how much I need. Um, but sometimes I don't want to leave the house and I just want to, you know, click, click and, like, wait for it to, to come to my door. So um, I think, yeah, I think we're going to start to see a, a sort of diversification where we do lots of different types of shopping, and, mm -hmm. and I think online is definitely going to be in the mix. Um, yeah, even at least for me. Yeah. I can remember last time I looked for grocery items on Amazon, I was trying to find Fa Fanta Limon, <laughs> basically like Fanta, lemon Fanta that I drink in Spain, but it's made without high fructose corn syrup, and so, and it just has this flavor, and it's so citrusy and delicious, and it's, you know, Fifteen dollars for like two cans. Mm -hmm. I just remember thinking like, "There's got to be a better solution." I had the same experience. I was searching for um, in-season persimmons for oh, yeah. a client, and I couldn't. I'm like, "It's you got to be able to Google it. You can yeah. Google anything, and it'll just happen magically." Yeah. No, I couldn't find any online. Gosh. How do you find? Yeah, that's present. Okay, so I wanted to show. I don't know if this is gonna work playing YouTube through a uh, Google Hangout, but this is a Portlandia clip about a zero packaging grocery <laughs> store, which is leading up to a conversation about ingredients. Can you hear it? I don't know if this is going to work. I can see it, but I can't hear it. Here, maybe I could, um, <laughs> I've seen enough times, maybe I can. Okay, so here they are, they're talking about this, hey, newfangled zero packaging grocery store. <laughs> What's that all about? And then we cut to these <laughs> Fictional um, rats who they too are just finding out about the zero packaging store and they can't believe it. They're like, you know, is this really going to happen? A store without any packaging? No plastic? No bags? No um, nothing to keep the rats out? And so then they call the store and um, they basically are like double checking that they're understanding the concept correctly. And then essentially they. Um, they, they realize that they can't actually just have a free-for-all, and so then the clip proceeds where they go in and they just kind of eat themselves silly, and, um, you know, it's like a rat's dream come true, <laughs> which I'm sure uh, places like Ingredients just love. This is the new, it's a zero-packaging grocery store over in East Austin that opened a year ago. That seems about right. And I don't know if you guys remember that when they announced that store, the Internet blew up. <laughs> Um, this is like two years ago. Um, 
somehow like word got out and they have a great marketing team behind them and and it was making CNN and it was just it was NBC Nightly News I mean it was wow. coast to coast because um, they were sort of in the in the works of making of, of, of opening the first grocery store that was that you brought your own jars and bags and reusable stuff and you know just kind of getting away from this society where everything is in a thing like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then it ended up taking them a little bit longer than I think they thought it would to open. And when it finally opened, you know, I walked in there for the first time and realized that it's essentially a, a big bulk section. Right. But everything's in bulk. And so oil and vinegars and, um, you know, which a lot of these nicer grocery stores have anyway, you know, yes. Central Market or mm -hmm. Whole Foods. And even other grocery stores like ETB are now having bulk spice sections, which I think are a really big shift, you know, because you don't, Curry, for instance, is great. It's better when it's fresh. Right. So you might as well just get what you need. Um, but, you know, due to FDA regulations, uh, ingredients, they actually have to use packaging for milk and dairy and other dairy um, and, and meat. You know, you can't just have, like, a refrigerator. <laughs> I don't you know, meat. <laughs> and you put in your own little bag. Yeah. And so um, so I, I have stopped referring it to it as a zero packaging grocery store because it's pack it's a packaging light grocery store which I you know I think is a very refreshing change and I, I think it's an interesting business model but it's also become just a, a destination for people to go and grab a beer because they have you know a TBC permit where you can drink on site mm -hmm. or they'll go and, and bring in a growler and get it filled with nice beer and it's in you know part of town where there aren't a whole lot of options for for super fresh local produce, mm -hmm. and so they do carry local farms, um, you know, produce from local farms. But I, it's just funny that Portland Day clip came out right at the same time as this store was making all this news, and you know, people got really excited about the idea of cutting down on their eco footprint by having uh, less packaging. But you know, then you realize that a lot of these rules exist for you know food safety reasons, and, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so you can't sort of vilify them too much keeping rats out of your packaging. <laughs> yeah, I sort of feel like uh, places like Ingredients exist to sort of push the limits um, in terms of what is possible in our, in our grocery shopping landscape. It's not going to be your everyday store, but it starts to open up possibilities so that, you know, even a Randall's can now imagine a bulk section. Yeah. Whereas right. five years ago, it was unthinkable for, you know, for that... Uh, that's a, really, that's a really good point. And, you know, maybe that's what all of these um, extremes, if you will, even, um, you know, like the bag ban, which is going to be my next question for you guys. Um, yeah, I mean, it just challenges us to think a little bit differently, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the whole point is that we're all evolving in, in how we cook and how we shop. And, you know, maybe you don't buy, you know, grass-fed beef every time, but maybe once every three times. And, or, and then maybe, you know, you're starting to think about eating less meat or in smaller portions. I know that in our house, that's certainly a change that we've seen happen. And that's a na nationwide trend that we're seeing, you know, what we used to have used for all four people. You know, now we're maybe using, like, one portion of meat and trying to spread it out across all four people. And so, yeah, you know, I think that's good. Um, what are your thoughts on the bag again? I'm, you know, I'm for it. I think... Plastic bags are annoying, honestly. Mm -hmm. The disposable. Yeah. Um, I forget, you know, yeah. like everyone else, I'm sure. But keep them in your car. Right. Work. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I would be curious to know how much money that's saving stores mm -hmm. and those sort of figures. But it makes sense. I mean, there's no reason to have plastic bags, you know. Floating in the wind I all see, over I town. I see fewer bags. I mean, totally we live kind agree. of at the end of a street where, you know, all the bags yeah. kind of flow to. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I don't have to pick as many of them up. Yeah. Uh, Will, how, how's the bag ban going for you? Um, I'm definitely pro bag ban. I, I've attended a lot of conferences in the last decade, and so I've built up a huge cache <laughs> of canvas tote bags. Everybody um, loves a tote bag, right? Yeah, and I never used them. And so now I have this this like regular um, you know rotation of bags and you know it's great I, I take six or so to the grocery store and then throw them in the laundry when I get home and rotate in another six and um, and so it's I think it's fantastic um, one area where uh, I still miss the plastic bags is for emptying the cat box um, yeah. but, but you know other than that 
Um, you yeah. know, I bet there are enough bags sitting in people's, you know, enough hordes of bags tucked uh -huh. in every corner of the city. You know, maybe some, uh, you know, little entrepreneurial startup guy or girl could figure out a way to connect the people who have the cats and have the need with the people yeah. who've been gathering up them for years right. and can't throw yeah. them away, but will, would never be able to use them all. Donate them to a, a dog walker. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, my mother-in-law did bring me a huge cache of plastic bags last okay. time she visited. So, you know, I'm set for the foreseeable future. So it's no problem for me. Yeah, I've heard that um, that particular argument a lot of you know, if, and often from people who are are arguing against the bag ban and sort of saying, well, you know, kind of with this expectation that my free bags are gone. Like I have this right to free bags, which <laughs> one is kind of an interesting piece of logic, but the other thing that I try to remind people is that, I mean, there's really no such thing as a free lunch and there's no such thing as a free bag and you were paying for those bags anyway, you just didn't right. realize it. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, whether, I mean, it's not that we're going to see prices go down at the grocery store because they're not having to buy bags, but ideally in my mind I'm thinking that perhaps prices might stay, you know, level for a little bit longer, you know, to sort of compensate for that. But, you know, I... I'm like you guys, I have a stash that I just try to remember. Mm -hmm. um, I do often underestimate how much I'm going to shop. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Because it's like, and then you buy the whatever, 25 cents. Yeah. 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 And use that again. So, right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting to sort of watch the different stores and their responses. You know, that um, I, I have heard lots of people complaining that HEB doesn't give away any paper bags. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if they might ever cave on that or not. But I know they're holding out for now. Yeah, you've got to go to the high dollar central market in order to get the... Uh, the high dollar. <laughs> yeah. It's always yeah. amazing when you go into central market and find, you know, the exact same thing, you know, say butter, you buy every week or, you know, yeah. so you know how much it costs at H-E-B and you go to uh, central market and it's 50 cents higher. Mm -hmm. You're like, why is that? Um, yeah. So um, let's talk about one, one last little uh, piece here uh, about... Central Market and Whole Foods, that both of those stores have put a lot of money into renovation and, in Whole Foods' case, opening new stores. And um, I was surprised that Central Market didn't choose to open up another location. They pumped $5 million into their South store in the mm -hmm. past year. But Whole Foods is getting ready to have five local stores. Wow. Which seems like an amazing number to me. Mm -hmm. um, but, Will, what do you think, you know, this uh, – do you think they're scrambling to catch up, you know, to make sure that all their bases are covered now that Trader Joe's is here? Do you think those changes would have happened anyway? Um, I don't know. It's, you know, it's still packed. Um, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the South Central Which market. Central market? Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what happens now that Wheatsville's open right across the street and, and there's yeah. so much competition. Um, but... Again, I think, I mean, for me personally, it's going to be mood-based shopping, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes I'm going to feel, like, in the mood for going to a grocery store that has, you know, a live band playing, uh, at, as is the case at Central Market. And, like, sometimes I'm just going to want to get in and get out, and, mm -hmm. you know, I might wind up um, at a different grocery store. So, I don't know. I, I feel like it's going to distribute. Um, I, I don't think we're going to see as much loyalty to one store now that there are so many options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I am. Um, that's one thing I do like that I think or Whole Foods when they initially remodeled that downtown store because they're remodeling it again. Mm -hmm. But like when they first put in that wine bar and you know the little restaurants that have always been in there. I hate to tell you, you can call them restaurants. You know, countertop service. Yeah. You know, right. eating establishments, but where you could go and have a beer either at the beginning of, middle of, or end of your grocery shopping trip. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of an interesting thing that now we're seeing in, in some other locations, like the new HEB over there at the Miller development. Um, they have a fancy craft beer selection. Huh. I mean, it is nice. And I kind of wish my HEB had a beer selection so I could right. treat myself after a nice grocery shop. Yeah. But that's one evolution that I think is interesting that we'll see more of is, is stores trying to keep you, keep you there longer. You know, so that you can maybe eat a lunch or eat dinner or have a snack and then, you know, it's just it's a way to keep you spending money. It I definitely is. I think for, yeah. for someone like me, it, going to the grocery store isn't a Friday night event. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say I haven't had dinner at one of the Whole Foods 
counter whatever you want, a cafe. I um, kind of um, heard that it's actually um, like a super popular uh, place for blind dates. Or and I've heard or like it's like a pick up. Yeah, I mean, we're not single, but you know. Yeah. Um, but no, the, it it was a good experience, and for two people for dinner, I think we sat at the the one where they have by the fish counter. Um, and the bottles of wine are the same as grocery prices, so you can have a nice, nice dinner right. um, for inexpensive and pick something up. Let's see, I wouldn't do that all the time, but I think there are people that going to Whole Foods, you know, headquarters on Lamar is an an, an event and experience, and they definitely make it. Right. So I still love taking people to that store. Oh yeah, I take everyone from out of town there. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, see it. I love those things, too, and sometimes, like, you know, the first rule of grocery shopping is don't go hungry, so if you have to grab a bite before <laughs> you start shopping, it's yeah. probably going to save you money in the long run. Um, yeah. But there's also an element of sort of bread and circuses to Central Market and Whole Foods and stuff where, like, part of me really loves that festival atmosphere. There's always a festival going on. There's music. There's, you know, food that you can eat right there. But then part of me is, like, just give me cheaper pr produce. Just give me cheaper groceries. Just give me stuff that I can afford. Yeah. You know? And so it's hard to... I, I'm ambivalent about the the sort of bread and circuses atmosphere of some of those flagship stores, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a very good point. Yeah, there's often times where I, I totally agree where it's nice and it's if it's more of a relaxing atmosphere, mm -hmm. but there's also times where I'm like, Oh my God! Why is there a band playing? And there's like kids, and there are people grilling hot dogs out front. And I'm just like, get, tone yeah. it down. I mean, it makes me a little nuts. The, the flagship Central Market. I mean, the one downtown has that too. But um, we had a book club there a couple weeks ago, and it was at seven o'clock on a Saturday night. And I've never been to that Central Market at seven o'clock on a Friday night, so I kind of just guessed that that would be an okay time. There was hardly a table to spare. And by the time we left at like 9.30, the patio was still jam-packed full of people dancing and having a good time. Yeah. And, um, and you know, thinking back to, you know, my earliest grocery shopping days where there were two options. This is in my small little Missouri town. Um, and there was nothing to do except get the groceries and you go home. And then even in the town, there wasn't a place necessarily for live music all the time. And, um, it, I mean, we, we do have this embarrassment of riches. Right yeah. Now. yeah, and and you know I hate to be too cynical about any of them because they're all great choices, and it's nice that we have the options. And it kind of makes me, in some ways, uh, miss the good old little city market down off of um, South First and Ben White. I don't know if any of you guys remember that one, but it was just bare bones. It just closed like maybe six six months ago. Uh, you know, just one of those kind of offbeat markets, but they had the best produce prices. You get 10 lines for a dollar pretty much year-round. Um, I always no wondered about that place, but I never went in. No? <laughs> well, that's why it closed. Right. right. <laughs> right. Um, but, I, but now it's this huge grocery space. I just, I don't know what's going on in there. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Is that the one by 7-Eleven? Yes. Yeah, right okay. by 7-Eleven. Um, but it was kind of a place where you could just pop in, and you know, they had this, like, pepper bacon. <laughs> That was just cheap. I mean, the meat was so cheap. It was um, not exactly, didn't really hold, uphold those ideals that, you know, maybe we'd fill in some of these other places do, but it served a purpose, uh -huh. and it never, you, there were always grocery carts. I swear to God, at Trader Joe's this morning, there were no grocery carts. All the grocery carts were in use. It blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the grand opening, you know, hoopla blow, sort of blows my mind in any sense but uh any other parting thoughts on grocery stores you want to share will um no i really wish that everybody would stop using the word foodie though oh yeah i'm, with you. Foodie. I'm with you i do too i have come full circle on that it kind of embarrasses me would yeah. you rather <laughs> would you rather foodist can i call you a foodist anything but foodie for now like baby really? food. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I, I think working it into the sort of marketing is like really where it it was just too much for me. Just like, oh yeah. Because like well, that's like a designation at some market. Stores. Yeah. 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 You're a food. Uh, that's that's like your your staff categorization. Right. Yeah. My argument about that is that I just if there were a better word, I would happily use it. But or you know because food enthusiast. There's got to be a way to describe somebody who is interested in food in a way that's, a, you know, 
sort of above average or not yeah. average, but um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer because yeah, you really agree on me too. But. Yeah. Um, Megan, anything else? What makes the what's the the signature of a, a grocery store? When you walk into a grocery <laughs> store, something that would either make you turn around and walk out, or that makes you know that you have um, you know come to the right place. Um, I gotta say, like a, a neutral smell. Uh, <laughs> if I walk in somewhere and there's a little bit of a funk in the air, yeah. I'm I'm gonna leave. And that could be like one little rotted yeah. apple that's just like right in the face. So I, I like it, a nice neutral straw. Then that probably eliminates empty supermarket for you. Yeah. Yeah. That grocery store, when we were talking about the bag man, I almost brought that up. Um, I think MT, they must have gotten a variance from the city because they are just giving out those flimsy plastic bags like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> um, so either my hope is that they're legally doing so under a variance from the city or, you know, maybe yeah. I just don't care. But that place has, has certainly has a um, has a smell to it, but yeah. it's also the only place in town where you can get pretty much, I think we go, I'll go there just for the basmati rice. It's like $5 for, you know, it's like a dollar a pound or something. Oh, wow. Yeah. And plus their selection, I'm a ramen yo fan on the bachelor. Really? Yeah. And they have the a ramen selection that, oh my gosh, I mean, it is just all these different noodles and all these different flavors and they're all under a dollar and, you know, I can probably eat a different one every day of the month and yeah. not get sick of them. So... All right. Well, we'll uh, wrap it up here. Uh, thank you guys so much for participating. And, you know, yeah. we'll take more questions on our Google Plus page. We posted the cookie butter, homemade cookie butter recipe there. We posted the cookie butter cupcake recipe that oh. ran in Wednesday's food section. One of the best chocolate cupcakes I've ever had. And so, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts about sort of the changing grocery landscape and, um, you know, what Trader Joe's and Wheatsville and how all this kind of fits together. So... Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.